Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Sea Air and Space Museum's live virtual programming. Thanks so much for joining us today for our stellar spacecraft program. My name is Alicia and I'll be your host. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering our programming, we invite you to click on the link in the comments or in the description. So everyone, feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before, or if you plan on maybe visiting us sometime soon. And of course, if you've got any questions today, feel free to pop them in there as well. All right, so today we are going to be talking a bit about spacecraft landers, specifically things that have landed both here on Earth as well as on the moon and even on other planets. But before we get to those, Let's recap a little bit about the Intrepid itself and our special connection to space. Why are we even talking about space stuff in the first place, right? Well, if you aren't already familiar, everyone, this is the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. So we are located in a historic World War II era aircraft carrier, the USS Intrepid. It was constructed way back in 1943 and is now a museum docked just a few blocks away from Times Square in Manhattan, right on the Hudson River. So maybe you visited before, or maybe you're looking forward to visiting us in person in the future. But either way, if you are in the neighborhood, it is kind of hard to miss. <laughs> we like to say that the Intrepid is so big that if you stood it up on its end, it would actually be taller than a New York City skyscraper. It'd be right up there with all the others. And it's also so long that you could just about play three games of football on it at the exact same time. Now, the Intrepid served in three wars. World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And, of course, in 1982, we became the Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum. But sometimes people get a little bit confused and they wonder, well, why are we a sea, air, and space museum? What's that space part all about, right? Well, let's rewind for a second. We are, of course, a sea museum because we are a naval ship. In fact, uh, this is one of the four propellers on it. You can see on the right there that were on the Intrepid. Uh, it pushed it through the water and now inside uh, it is there on display for you to see. Very, very large. So we've obviously got some pretty strong ties to the sea. But you know, there's other kinds of propellers as well. Here's another one. On the front of this plane, of course, this is the Avenger from World War II, the oldest plane in our collection. It was a torpedo bomber. You can actually see the torpedo sitting right underneath there. So this is just one of the reasons why we are an air museum. The Intrepid carried a number of airplanes in its time and service. And in fact, we could actually fit about 100 planes on the ship at a time. And it also had the ability, of course, to launch and land the planes as well, just like you might do at an airport. So we like to say it was basically a floating airport. Now, later on during the Cold War, we also had a bunch of jet planes like the Fury here that moved much faster and didn't use propellers. We also even had helicopters, too, which were used to rescue people from the ocean. So, all right, yep, clearly we are an air museum because we were an aircraft carrier. We have a whole bunch of airplanes, we have a whole bunch of helicopters. We're still not really sure about space, right? Well, take a look at this. If you are walking around on the hangar deck of the Intrepid, you're gonna see this thing and it does kind of stick out a little bit. There's a bunch of sea things, there's a bunch of air things, and then there is this. So let me know in the chat if you happen to know what is this thing that we are looking at? Does anyone happen to know? It is this big kind of um, black, kind of almost light bulb shaped thing. All right, it says United States on the side of it. It has a flag. Some people say it kind of looks like an ice cream cone that's been tilted on its side or uh, maybe even a megaphone, you know, that amplifies your voice. What is that? Oh, Queen of the Banshee says Gemini capsule. Absolutely close. All right. So it is a space capsule. Yeah, this is actually a Mercury capsule. So one right before that. This is a very special, special vehicle. Again, a space capsule. And it is the thing that takes astronauts up into space. Now, capsules ride up on top of a rocket. Of course, the rocket is the thing that takes it into space. All that fire comes out the bottom. But then once it gets into space, it actually separates. And this part, the space capsule, can continue to float around up there. So those capsules were part of the earliest stages of our space program. The Mercury capsules really just part of, you know, seeing if we could even survive up in space, if we could reach outer space in the first place. But again, this is Project Mercury. 
Now, this thing that you're looking at here is a replica of one of those early capsules called the Mercury Aurora 7. And uh, how many people do you think could fit inside of this thing? Just looking at it here. How many full size people, you know, a fully grown man here, one of our early astronauts. It's not really the biggest looking uh, vehicle, is it? So, yeah, if you said one person could fit inside, you'd be correct. It is, in fact, pretty small and pretty cramped in there, too. Now, in 1962, the astronaut who went up into space in the Aurora 7 was named Scott Carpenter. And here he is next to the Mercury Atlas rocket that took him up into space. So Scott Carpenter was actually only up in outer space for about five hours. He did three orbits around the Earth before then coming safely back down to Earth as well. But this is really important. You know, if you've got this big spacecraft hurtling down through the atmosphere, you pretty much need to make sure you have a good landing spot there, right? You don't want it to land on someone's house or anything like that. And also you have to think about how it can land safely too. So they decided that the best place for all of those capsules to land would in fact be in the ocean. There you go. The Earth is about 70% water anyway, so they figured, all right, this is a nice, easy target. It's a lot safer. It's, you know, a little bit nicer, softer landing surface than on land or, you know, in a desert or on a mountain or something. So uh, you've got Scott Carpenter landing into the ocean. All right. This is actually an image from one of our later uh, missions as well. Uh, but you can notice there's these big parachutes, right, that come out on top here. So when those parachutes come out, it helps to increase the drag. It helps to slow the capsule down as it comes in for a landing. And uh, it helps it to get to a much safer speed so that the astronaut doesn't get hurt. So this whole event here is actually called Splashdown. And it makes a lot of sense. It splashes down into the water. But, you know, if something this big is going to land in the ocean, NASA still, of course, has to come pick it up, right? And, of course, they want to pick up the astronaut inside and make sure he's okay, too, right? You can't just leave him stranded in the middle of the ocean. So they sent out a helicopter to rescue him. But in the case of Scott Carpenter in particular, he wasn't exactly where he was supposed to be. They couldn't find him for quite some time. And that's because while he was wrapping up his mission, Scott Carpenter had gotten a little bit distracted. And as a result, he ended up splashing down over 200 miles off course. Well, fortunately, eventually they were able to track him down and he was just fine. So they ended up picking him up and flying him to the closest airport that happened to be in the water, which also just happened to be the Intrepid. So here he is, everyone, on board the Intrepid. How cool is it that we have these photos? He's on board the ship. We, uh, you know, you can see him surrounded there on the left by some officers and onlookers, all right, on board on the, our flight deck there after being picked up from his capsule in 1962. A very momentous occasion, of course. And uh, on the right there, there he is walking around inside of our ship. And I always do love to point out he's wearing a really cool pair of cons there, too. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the reason why we are a space museum. The Intrepid played a very important role in retrieving astronauts and their capsules after they returned from outer space. Now, the Mercury capsule wasn't the only one that we picked up. We also picked up another one, which was mentioned a little bit earlier in the chat. We picked up the next series of missions here, uh, particularly in this series, the Gemini missions. Um, this was named actually after the constellation of Gemini, the twins, because it was the first time that NASA sent two astronauts up into space together inside of the castle castle, <laughs> capsule, excuse me, uh, and not quite a castle. And on board the Gemini 3 mission in particular, we had John Young, who you can see on the left, and Gus Grissom, who was on the right. So these two astronauts went up into outer space. They orbited the Earth three times again, and then, very similar to the other one, splashed down into the Atlantic Ocean. So here is a picture of the Intrepid retrieving the Gemini capsule from the ocean in 1965. And in those photos, you can see actually this yellow thing around it, this little floaty. This is called a flotation collar, and it was used to help a capsule to float in the water while it was waiting to be picked up. 
And they actually added this a little later in the missions because Gus Grissom, one of the astronauts, uh, and his first mission to space, he was in a Mercury capsule called the Liberty Bell 7. And when he landed in the ocean all by himself in his Mercury capsule, his door accidentally opened. It blew off and he uh, had landed and the capsule actually started to fill up with water and it sunk. Now, luckily, he was fine. He was rescued in time, but his capsule did not fare so well. It actually sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and it took him over 20 years to be able to find and retrieve it. And uh, so, you know, adding a floaty like that was really important to make sure that they were kept safe after landing. So these earlier NASA missions, everyone, you know, they had a lot of experiments going on, lots of tests to see how humans would just fare in outer space and how to get the equipment just right before heading off all the way to our main goal of the space race, which was, of course, getting to the moon. So before we head on to that era of space flight, after we've talked a little bit about our Mercury capsules and, you know, kind of landers of the ocean here, uh, I want to see if we've got any questions so far. Any questions at all? Why did they only send up two astronauts during the Gemini missions, right? So, you know, I mentioned before that the Mercury missions were pretty short and also pretty small. Uh, that capsule, again, only had one person inside of it. NASA was really taking baby steps throughout this process. So if you imagine each stage of NASA's missions as kind of like the life phases of the growth of a person, you can imagine it like the Mercury missions uh, are kind of, you know, baby steps. You are a newborn. You're just learning how to breathe in space, right? You're just learning how to eat baby food. Food, you know, mush or, uh, you know, literally applesauce like John Glenn did up there. Very, very simple motor skills, just figuring out how to move around and survive up there, right? That's Mercury. Then you've got the Gemini missions, and this is more kind of your toddler stage, right? So now you've got the opportunity to learn how to walk. This was the first time now we were taking our first extravehicular activity, so spacewalks. Um, this was also the first time we docked with another ship. So, you know, we like to say that's like making friends in space. And now you're also able to do things like eat some more solid foods as well. So to answer your question, why did they only send up two? Again, it's just part of these baby steps, right? We, we didn't want to send up a whole bunch of people at one time just yet, you know, just in case anything went wrong. Um, we were learning, you know, how to make things bigger also uh, to conserve energy, conserve fuel, conserve oxygen, and uh, think about things like food up there too. Uh, but eventually once we got into the space shuttle era, of course, we were sending, you know, seven, eight people at a time but we just wanted to make sure it was uh, sequential and take our time making sure everything and everyone was okay before then too. Great question. All right, any others? Did all capsules land in the Atlantic Ocean? No, they did not. Uh, so these two that we just talked about so far did land in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, at the time, they were being launched from Florida. So they were landing in the Atlantic Ocean, you know, the, the Bahamas, that area over there. Uh, it was easier for them to pick up to be able to retrieve the capsules and uh, take them back to headquarters, you know, get any data they needed off of it and, uh, you know, really inspect the machines there, learn what they needed to uh, from the missions. Uh, but later missions actually did land in the Pacific. Uh, Apollo 11, for instance, uh, that landed on the moon, that one did. And uh, there were other spacecraft that landed on, um, you know, on the desert as well later on, which sounds a little unusual. Um, maybe doesn't even sound very safe, but I'll explain why and how they were able to do it in just a minute. Um, so that's actually a really great se segue. Uh, so before we talk about the Apollo missions, which did come next after the Mercury and Gemini missions, of course, uh, which uh, Apollo then, of course, landed us on the moon, I do want to skip ahead to some other type of spacecraft that we've used to go into space and then land back on Earth again. So the next one that we actually did that did that um, outside of Apollo was this one. So everyone, this is the Space Shuttle Enterprise that we at the Intrepid are so very lucky to have in our collection up on the flight deck. This was the very first space shuttle ever built. This is the prototype orbiter. And when they were building these, the main goal was to figure out how to transport large things like satellites and telescopes and pieces of the International Space Station up into space. So it could hold a bunch more people, about seven or eight at a time. But it also had this big payload bay in the back that was totally empty. So you can think of it kind of like the trunk of a car or the back you know, of a big truck. And that area was used to bring up all of that extra equipment. So I'm actually gonna tell you a not so uh, secret though, you know, about our space shuttle here, at least this particular one. 
this space shuttle, the Space Shuttle Orbiter Enterprise here, it never actually went into space. It's true, but it is actually still very, very important. And of course, we still do love it very dearly. So this was a testing vehicle. Again, it was something called a prototype. And they needed to see if something this massive, this thing weighs, you know, 150,000 pounds, right? They wanted to see if something this big could actually even work. And the goal here was to get it to glide through the atmosphere. It's got, you know, you notice here, you know, this airplane design, not like the capsule. It really does kind of look like an airplane. They wanted it to be able to glide and also then land on a runway, just like an airplane. Because remember before, those capsules were one-time use. They would land in the ocean, and then they were recovered, and then essentially put into museums. But this one was a new design. NASA could now reuse it over and over and over again. And they did for many of them. Now, the Enterprise, again, did not go into outer space, but it did at least get up into the sky. And here are some photos of an actual test flight that it did. So normally when these things went up, you know, you see it, it's straight up and down. It's attached to, um, you know, the rocket. You've got those giant fuel tanks. They're orange and the two white ones there. That is the space shuttle stack. But this one didn't use a rocket like that during its testing. This one instead got a piggyback ride from a 747 airplane. Now, back in 1977, this jet lumbered down the runway and eventually it took off with a space shuttle on its back. It went up to 26,000 feet. It was flying about uh, just less than 500 miles an hour, which truly is not really that high or that fast. Commercial planes go much higher and faster. But as it's flying up there, it just dropped it, as you can see in these images here. So they separated, and then the Enterprise became a glider. It's just like a paper airplane, really. Uh, all it has are those wings and the tail. It doesn't have an engine that works, you know, within our atmosphere or anything. And so all it did was make banking turns just to try to slow itself down as it fell through the sky like a paper airplane. Really kind of an amazing uh, picture here. And again, it's also got its tail cone on, which is uh, how they used it uh, to, to travel with it, actually, to protect the engines for when it was uh, about to take off. So it would glide through the air, make banking turns, and then eventually it landed just like an airplane on a runway at an airport. So these shuttles, when they came back, they didn't have any fuel or any, you know, really any other controls other than the ability to control the, the flaps and the wings and the tail, the flight surfaces, to let it just turn slightly until it landed with its wheels on the runway. Uh, and in this picture, you can see the space shuttle Columbia actually landing at Edwards Air Force Base on one of its earlier missions. So NASA was pretty satisfied with these tests. They made a few other changes and then they created five other orbiters that were used to go into space. And in 2012, a year after they actually retired the space shuttle program altogether, we at the Intrepid Museum were lucky enough to receive one of the remaining shuttles. Now there are only four of the six still remaining. They are in museums across the country. There's one in Washington, DC, one in Florida, and one in California as well. Uh, and of course, one here in New York City at the Intrepid Museum. So come by and check it out in person if you get the chance. I will say this too, though, when the museum got the Enterprise back in 2012, we were so excited that we decided to celebrate it the same way it all began, on the back of a 747 jet doing a victory lap around Manhattan. So if you happen to be in the city at that time, you might have even seen that amazing sight yourself. I love this image. There it is on top of a jet. And right underneath it, if you look directly down, you can actually see the flight deck of our ship, of the Intrepid. Uh, if you see that little white airplane there, that's actually the Concorde that we also have on site too. Love this image. Now, after space shuttles, everyone, we didn't stop going into space. In fact, we went back using capsules again, just like this one. So this is a real Soyuz capsule in our shuttle pavilion. This one has actually been to outer space. Um, you can actually really see right at the top part there where it's a bit lighter. It's got some scorch marks from re-entry there. There are burn marks all along the sides there because it gets hot. There's a lot of friction when it comes back in. But this is what astronauts used to go into outer space after space shuttles. So these capsules are sent up by Russia. And until recently, they basically just sold seats to the United States in order to get up to the International Space Station. So the Soyuz has three main parts to it when it's in space. You've got the orbital module. All right, so that is what's going to connect to wherever you're going. So in this case, it's the International Space Station. So that's where it's going to dock. 
You've also got the re-entry module. All right, number two there. So that's the part that comes back home, the most important part, I would argue, and the one that we have in our museum, although it looks a little different, right? It's not covered in that silver anymore. And then the last part on the end there, this white part, number three, uh, that is the service module. So that has the heating and the cooling machinery and all of the electrical components to make everything run safely. So let's say, everyone, you are leaving the International Space Station and you're coming home to finish your mission. You would climb into a reentry module, just like our three friends on the left here. You can see three astronauts crammed in there, super, super tight. But what's actually really interesting about this is that they don't land in the water like our earliest capsules. These capsules actually took off from Kazakhstan near Russia, and they were sent up by the Russian Space Agency. So it didn't really make a lot of sense to land in the ocean because Russia isn't really near water, right? So instead, they landed in the desert. But because it's landing on dry land, they also had to think a little bit differently. It's got extra parachutes, first of all. Um, so it's able to they're able to come out and really slow it down. And then it's also got explosives on the bottom that explode downward to give it kind of a last minute little boost to counteract some of the speed when coming in for a landing. And that's what you see in that image there on the right. That is not a capsule you know, going kablamo on the ground there. That's actually the uh, the retro firing there in order to make sure it's got a little extra boost to slow it down as it's landing. So that's pretty much the rundown of how we have landed spacecraft here on Earth. Now, whether that be again on land or on water, but next we are gonna talk a little bit about landing in other places. So places like the moon or other planets. But before we get to that, let's pause again and see if we've got any other questions so far about anything, maybe about the Soyuz or anything like that too. Oh, great. Why was the Soyuz capsule used? Sure. So the Soyuz capsule was used because we stopped using space shuttles, really. Um, again, in 2011, they retired the space shuttle program. Um, it really just came down to the fact that it was very expensive um, and also kind of dangerous, unfortunately. You know, we did lose two of our space shuttles uh, and the astronauts who were on board as well. So they decided that the risk did not necessarily outweigh, you know, what they were doing at the time while they were using space shuttles as a whole. Uh, also, the their funding was cut, which, you know, is the reason that a lot of things end up going by the wayside. So it really did come down to money as well. Um, and they realized it would just be easier to buy tickets, just buy seats on board these Soyuz capsules that were put up by Russia uh, to get to the International Space Station. Um, so many countries actually were all working together up there. So we thought, yeah, we'd work together, too, and use the Soyuz capsules uh, to to bring us there. Uh, and there also actually was a, a private company, Space Adventures, who was able to sell some of those seats to private citizens as well. That's how we were able to get the one that we've got as well. Gregory Olson um, was a private citizen who was able to purchase a seat and uh, fly up and do some experiments himself as well. All right. Any others? How heavy was the space shuttle? Oh, very, very heavy. <laughs> so again, it's this huge thing. You've got all this equipment. Um, first of all, you've got this actual orbiter, right? So the white thing that we just looked at on the screen there. And then you've got also the payload bay uh, and anything that goes inside of the payload bay too. So if you've got a satellite with you or you've got a telescope or you know, some part of the International Space Station even, which is really how they built it, that is all going to add more weight as well. Um, plus, you've got the people on it, you've got, you know, food, anything else that you're going to be needing up there. So it's a lot. Um, it's actually about 165,000 pounds empty. But then you have to think about also the fuel and everything else. And really, you know, end of the day, you're looking closer at like, 4.4 million pounds. Uh, and that is, you know, why when you saw those space shuttles actually go up, they had those huge um, giant fuel tanks that those are attached to. Um, it, it's got the liquid fuel tank, the orange one, and the solid fuel tanks, those white ones. Those don't even make it all the way into space. They burn through all of the fuel that they've got, and then they actually separate, right? So um, when they're going up in there, they just drop back down, and some of it uh, you know, breaks up through the atmosphere. Others land uh, in the ocean, and then uh, eventually you know, once it's up there going around the planet, it's a bit lighter. Um, and then when it's done, it comes back down and lands on the runway. So there are components that are reusable. There's some that just burn up. Uh, but all in all, yeah, all that stuff adds up and it is super heavy for sure. Great question. All right. So everyone, as you know, uh, in 1969, the United States successfully landed humans on the moon. 
And it was, of course, with these three guys. So we have Neil Armstrong on the left. We have Buzz Aldrin on the right. And in the center, we have Michael Collins, who, uh, if you haven't heard that name before, uh, that's because he was the command module pilot. And he actually stayed in the capsule waiting to pick them back up again. So I like to say he was kind of like their getaway car. Now, landing on the moon, though, was a lot different than landing on Earth. And, well, why do you think that is? Let me know in the chat if you have any ideas. Why do you think landing on the moon might be different than landing on Earth? There's a few different things there, right? What are some of the differences between the Earth and the moon, right? Why, uh, why might it be a little bit more difficult? So even though the moon is pretty close to the Earth, relatively, they are very different. Things act a little differently on the moon than they do here on Earth. And that, of course, means that landing is going to be a lot different as well. So first of all, uh, you know, the first thing we can look at is definitely the terrain, right? The terrain is completely different. There are no oceans of water like we've got on Earth. The moon instead has this rocky terrain. It's got all these craters because things smash into it all the time because it doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, it takes a lot of the space debris, actually, that might come to hit us here on Earth. But it acts a little bit like a bodyguard, you know, it, it helps to shield us too. So you've got a lot of impact craters and you probably wouldn't want your astronaut to land on that or any of that rocky terrain. That could be a little tricky. But also the Earth has an atmosphere, right, that keeps the air that we breathe in surrounding the planet. That's the reason that we can actually use parachutes in the first place to slow us down when we come through the atmosphere. It catches on all of the air. Bash Sin I see says no atmosphere. Exactly. So the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to hold in air. So parachutes are not going to do us much good up there at all. Well, what are we going to do instead? Well, everyone, you know, if you've ever seen footage of astronauts on the moon, just like this, I love this. Um, they seem to bounce a lot, right? They take a little bit longer to come down. Well, that is also because, as I also see in the chat here, less gravity, right? Gravity is a bit different. It's about a sixth of what we have here on Earth. So that's also going to affect your landing strategy. So scientists had to come up with something very different, taking all of these things into consideration. And this is what they ended up designing. So this is a model of what put the first humans on the moon and what put, uh, you know, or what eventually actually brought them home safely as well. So again, and actually kind of similar to the Soyuz capsule, we've got number one, the service module that has the heating and cooling and electrical elements. Then we also have the command module. That's what comes back home again uh, and helps to, you know, it lands on the ocean. And then we've got number three, this part, the lunar module. Now, when the Saturn V rocket took off, it only actually had on it parts one and two. There was another rocket that took up uh, while, uh, while they were in space. They connected the third part, all right? They connected the lunar module to it. And how did they learn how to do that maneuver? Well, that was one of the things that they were testing out during the Gemini missions. See, baby steps, right? So the lunar module was actually an amazing vehicle because it was what ultimately landed us on the moon. It was made on Earth, but it only ever actually was used in outer space. They never could actually test it. But this is what it ultimately looked like. It looks a little funny, right? Let me know uh, in the comments if maybe you've ever seen anything like this before. Um, or maybe even, you know, what, what you think it kind of looks like. To me, I don't know, it kind of looks like a, like a bug, like a shiny spider maybe with all those legs sticking out. But you can actually see that those legs are hinged, all right? And that is because you really don't want the astronauts to land and, you know, ricochet or something, right? That you, you don't want them to, to bounce, really. Um, so they used, again, retro rockets instead of a parachute to help to slow it down, to power its descent, and then eventually land on the moon safely. But the legs really did take a lot of the shock on impact so that the astronauts didn't, like I said, you know, kind of get bounced around or get hurt. Although I'm sure it was a little bit bumpy when they landed. But the rest, everyone, is history, right? They did great work up there. And then when they were done, they climbed back into the lunar module, this top part up here, everyone. Uh, so the golden part at the bottom, that part's called the descent stage. That is the part with the thrusters to power you down to the surface. That was only ever needed to land. So they didn't need that part anymore. The top part, the part that to me actually kind of looks like a face, 
kind of looks like, you know, Optimus Prime or something. Uh, that is called the ascent module. So that part separates and goes back up to meet with the command module, which remember is floating around with Michael Collins up there waiting for them. So they were able to go up there and connect and then head safely back home again. Uh, and then of course, you know, they landed in the ocean and were picked up. So that is landing on the moon. Now, what about landing a little bit further away even? What about something like Mars? All right, Mars has been all over the news quite a bit because of course, earlier this year, we did land the Perseverance rover up there. It's doing some amazing things right now, that in Ingenuity, its little helicopter. But prior to Perseverance, we cannot forget, of course, about two of the other most famous rovers that we landed on Mars. All right, we have, of course, Spirit and Opportunity. There they are. Now, if you look at these, you might be thinking, hey, Alicia, you made a mistake. Looks like that's the same image twice. But no, my friends, your eyes are not deceiving you. Those are actually twin rovers. They do look exactly the same. So we sent twin rovers up to Mars. And now we are going to play a little game. I'm going to ask you a few questions about our twins here, Spirit and Opportunity. Let's see how much you know about our Mars rover twins. So I'll ask a question. And then if you think I'm talking about the rover Spirit, go ahead and type a one in the chat. And if you think I'm talking about opportunity, type a two in the chat, all right? So here we go, everyone. Here's our first question. Which one went the farthest? Which traveled the furthest? So give me a one or a two in the chat. One, if you think it was Spirit, or two, if you think it was opportunity. All right, so what do you think? Uh, both of these rovers were sent up to Mars to drive around the surface. There is, of course, a few minutes delay between the commands that we send here on Earth all the way out to Mars, but we can actually control the rovers remotely from here on Earth. So go ahead and write your answers in the comments. Which one do you think went the furthest? Was it one for spirit or two for opportunity? All right, Queen of Banshee says one. All right, any others? All right, we got some other answers coming in, excellent. All right, last few seconds. And the answer, everyone, is number two, opportunity. It went a grand total of 28 miles, whereas Spirit just went 4.8 miles. Oof. Well, there is a good reason for that, which isn't really uh, that far, right? But um, they had slightly different things that they were looking at, so that's okay. And I'll let you know why the other one didn't go quite as far in just a second. All right, next question, though. Which one got help from something called a dust devil? Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, Mars has lots and lots of dust across its surface. Of course, that red, rusty dust. And there are actually dust storms. So dust blows around all the time and it gets everywhere. So what ended up happening was dust blew onto one of these rovers and its solar panel sensors, so where it gets its power from, right? It got blocked. It blocked it up with all that dust so it wasn't getting power from the sun. So NASA was like, uh-oh, nope, that's it. It's done. That's it. It's dead. But luckily, a dust devil came along. It's basically a mini tornado of swirling dust and wind. And it blew all of the dust off of the panels and brought it back to life. So there you go. So which one of these was that? Was that one spirit or two opportunity? Go ahead and put your answer there. Take a wild guess. One spirit or two opportunity. Which one got some help from a dust devil. All right, I see some answers already. And the answer, everyone, is spirit, number one. And since you're probably curious, I'm going to show you a picture of a dust devil. There it is. Again, it is this swirling column of dust that just kind of moves across the surface. So a little mini tornado there. And thank goodness, because that helped to, you know, revive it and clear off the solar panels. All right, next question. Which one of these had a broken wheel that made a great discovery? Was it spirit or opportunity? Type one for spirit or two for opportunity. Which one had a broken wheel? And because the wheel was broken, it helped it to figure out something really special about Martian soil. Hmm. But Ashton says spirit because it's got spirit. I like that. <laughs> nice. All right. We've got some answers coming in. Excellent. Excellent. All right, last few seconds here. Answer one or two. And the answer is 
Spirit, good job, good job. So Spirit had a broken wheel that helped us to discover something really cool. So take a look at this picture here. Yeah, you're probably wondering, what is that? That looks like dirt. Well, it is. They studied this dirt though, because as Spirit was moving along, it was actually dragging its broken wheel along with it. And it uncovered this, silicates, which are really, really good indicators of the presence of life. So that doesn't mean, of course, that there currently is life, but that maybe at one point in the past, Mars might have had life. And that is a discovery that was made all thanks to that broken wheel. How, how great is that? Very fortuitous there. So last question. All right. Which rover had the longer mission length? Now, again, both of these rovers were launched in the summer of 2003, pretty close to each other. So which one had the longer mission length? Was it Spirit, type one, if you think it was Spirit, or was it Opportunity, type two, if you think it was Opportunity? Which one had the longer mission length, Spirit or Opportunity? All right, last few seconds here, get those answers in, type a one or a two for me. All right, and the answer, everyone, is... Opportunity, number two. So Opportunity had a longer mission. Spirit's mission was six years long, probably because of all the problems that it was having, you know, we already talked about. But Opportunity's mission was 16 years long. Really amazing. So they both did a lot of really incredible work for NASA along the way there. Uh, so amazing. Opportunity, 16 years. Now, how did they land on Mars, right? Because Mars is a lot different than Earth. There, again, is no uh, liquid oceans anyway that we know of so far. Uh, and also, it is different even than the moon, right? Mars has gravity. Again, a little bit less than Earth, but it is there. It also has an atmosphere, but it's a lot thinner than it is here on Earth. And also, we're landing somewhere really far away. So there's going to be a little bit of a delay between when we send signals and then when they receive it and know, you know what to do next. But this is how they did it. So everyone, take a look at this, kind of similar to the Soyuz capsule there where they sent out parachutes to slow it down. They also then fired those retro rockets to slow it down even more underneath it to stabilize it, kind of like a lunar lander. But even further down, we can see something that looks a little bit like a bunch of grapes. Do you all see that right at the bottom there? It's like a little, you know, stack of pearls or something hanging at the bottom. Well, inside of that little bunch of grapes there, is where the rover actually is. So they are these big balloon kind of things. They actually bounce. They land and they bounce around on the surface of Mars until they get to, there it is bouncing a little bit, until they get to a nice place to settle. And then they do. So then you've got these balloons, these grapes, these pearls, these basketballs, whatever you want to call them. And they get all in there, they settle, and then eventually they deflate. And they shrivel up and they kind of look like, I don't know, little raisins or a little brain or something. And then eventually, once that is over, they open up and they reveal the little golf cart sized rover inside. But these aren't the last things that we sent to Mars, everyone, right? The last two things that we sent were curiosity and perseverance. Now, they actually got to Mars a little differently, and I'm going to show you how. Um, I'm actually going to show you a side-by-side -side video of both Curiosity and the latest rover, Perseverance, landing on Mars. Um, the one that you see that's an animation, it's going to mainly be on the left there. Um, that is going to be Curiosity, kind of a simulation of what that looked like. And then on the right, it's going to be actual visuals from the Perseverance landing back in February of this year. Uh, but they call this segment of the trip, this kind of landing time here, the seven minutes of terror. Because during this time period, we really don't know what's going on with the rover. We lose all communication because of interference with the Martian atmosphere uh, until, of course, later, which is, of course, how I'm going to show you this footage, courtesy of NASA. Uh, but at that time, everyone's holding their breath. They're biting their nails. I don't know what's going on. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share this video for you. And I'll make it a little bit bigger here as well. Oh, not that one. That's what it looks like uh, when it's on there. All right, here we go. All right, so the first thing that happens is as it's coming in, oh, let's let it load here. Let me try this one more time. There we go. Oh, hopefully this plays. 
as it's coming in, you know what? I'm going to try it one other way because I think I was having problems with this earlier. Go ahead and unshare this. Great. All right, my friends. I'm going to go ahead and actually share a video file here. Do, do, do. Technology. Here we go. Okay. So, um, again, this is going to be uh, uh, Perseverance uh, on the right and uh, Curiosity on the left. Here we go. Excellent. So as it is coming in, everyone, the first thing that's going to happen is the straighten up maneuver. So this is where it's actually going to be coming into the atmosphere and it's going to correct itself to put most of its bottom facing the ground because it's going to generate a lot of friction. It's going to be a lot of heat. So you can actually, you know, take your hands, rub them together really fast. That can generate some friction. So you can kind of see how that heat would work. Uh, but we want to make sure it's safe. So the heat shield helps to deflect it, helps to spread it out from the main part of the capsule. But once it starts to stabilize, it's still moving really fast, about 430 meters per second. So to avoid crash landing, it's going to deploy parachutes. There they go. Now, fun fact, the orange and white parachute on the right there, it actually has a message in binary code. It says, dare mighty things. That's the motto of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Next thing that happens, you might have noticed there right after the parachute, the heat shield comes off. So we don't need that part anymore. We're already in the atmosphere, but that comes off because there's radar and a camera on the bottom of the rover. And that's going to be taking pictures of the Mars terrain as it comes in for a landing. So it's checking in real time to make sure that there's a safe place to land, that there's no rocks or no hazardous terrain in the way of the landing spot. So now it's actually locking its radar onto the ground. It's using something called terrain relative navigation. It's finding a nice, smooth place to land. And as it continues to descend with its parachute, it's going to start priming its landing engine. So it's going to start getting ready to separate, but not quite. Still looking around, still trying to find a really good, nice, smooth place to land. Then at about two and a half kilometers high, they don't need the parachutes anymore. So those are going to detach in just a second. There they go. All right. And then we can start to fire those retro rockets to slow us down even more and also to help to move us to the best landing spot that it's found. But those rockets, they don't want them to get too close to the surface. And we still, of course, have to make sure that there's not a lot of shock when the rover lands because we don't want it to break, right? So at this point, then they are able to pull out something called the sky crane. And that's at about 20 meters off the surface. And that actually lowers the rover to the ground so that it can safely separate. So again, we don't really have those bouncy grapes like the last time. Now they are a little bit different. And then, of course, everyone cheers <laughs> when it when it lands. That is the uh, most mandatory part, of course. I was cheering at home as well when I saw that happen, too. So that is basically, everyone, how uh, how it, it has landed now in, in recent days, really, how we have been able to land uh, the most recent rovers on Mars. Um, and actually, it's a really wonderful thing because we are able to use this uh, relative terrain uh, navigation system that's on board in order to make sure that it can find the most optimal spot. We are looking for, again, a nice smooth place, a nice, you know, really wonderful area to uh, to land. And then everyone, this last image that I have here, it's actually a selfie or I guess, you know, two selfies taken by Perseverance on its robotic arm back in April. Um, so Perseverance is the newest rover to land on Mars. You just saw those visuals of it landing back in February. Uh, and specifically, its mission is to uh, search for signs of life, so past or present. And something else really cool about Perseverance is that it has a little drone, which you can actually see in that selfie too right behind it on the left. It's a little helicopter named Ingenuity um, that's flying around on the surface of Mars. So we are doing such unbelievable things right now uh, that we've never ever done before. Technology is so cool. Uh, and another fun little fact here, they actually attached a small piece of the wing covering from the Wright Brothers original 1903 Wright Flyer um, to the uh, the underside there. So um, the first powered aircraft on Earth, really. Um, they attached it to a cable underneath the helicopter's solar panel. So this little, you know, tribute to our first steps of flight here on Earth, uh, but up there as we kind of take our first flight on Mars. Uh, also, actually, another fun fact, in 1969, um, for the moon landing, Neil Armstrong also carried something similar from the Wright Flyer to the moon in the lunar lander 
uh, or in the lunar module as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we're paying tribute to the past as we look forward to the present. So uh, I want to see if we've got any uh, last questions as we round out the program for today. Any other questions? Have the rovers come back from Mars? So no, once they are there, they stay there. Mars is, you know, it's pretty far away. It takes a little over eight months just to get there. And we also don't really have anything to launch them back home to us, unfortunately. Uh, so they just, you know, send data back through signals. But uh, I do think that once we send astronauts, people to the surface of Mars, um, eventually, I do believe probably one of their missions is to bring back, um, you know, some of the smaller things that we've sent, like, you know, Pathfinder, which is this really small rover that went up before the twin rovers even. Um, so bringing home maybe more for sentimental value than anything else. But the rovers up there are collecting samples. And uh, there is some thought that maybe they could figure out a way to collect the samples. And then this sounds so silly, but basically like, you know, throw it up back up into the atmosphere and have someone, you know, have an interception and, and pick it up and bring it back home. So who knows? Maybe we'll get some samples sooner than that. But as of right now, yeah, those rovers aren't coming home anytime soon. All right. Any other questions? Is someone controlling the probes like a remote control car? I mean, essentially, yeah. Um, like I mentioned, you know, before, though, there is, of course, a delay. So you kind of have to wait for that signal to go before the rover can accept the command. Um, and you really have to pay attention to what it's sending back, too, because, of course, you know, we don't want it to end up, you know, upside down in a ditch somewhere, right? So it is kind of like a remote control car in that way. Um, you know, if it flips upside down, you, you are going to have to go fix it. Uh, but we can't really go pop over to Mars and just flip it over. So unless you've got, you know, the help of a dust devil or something like that, uh, we do have to be very, very careful. But essentially, yeah, they send signals and kind of tell it where to go. All right, my friends. So that concludes our stellar spacecraft program for today. If you've got any other questions about our programs, you can reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, or also through social media. Be sure to follow, though, or subscribe to this channel and visit our website for our upcoming programs. Our next family program is next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. We'll be doing Code Breakers, where we are going to investigate how the Navy sent some coded secrets messages out there uh, in a variety of ways. And you can also try out your hand in deciphering a few as well. So once again, that is next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. We've also got a short survey that we'll link to in the chat. We'd love to get your feedback about this and our other programs as well. So if you've got a second, please do head on over and fill that out for us too. Uh, our museum is open to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. again. So if you are in the area or passing through, uh, we'd love to see you. Come, on, uh, come back on site and uh, you know check out all the cool things, including, of course, our space shuttle that we, uh, we've got here. And uh, you can see it for yourself in person, nose to nose. All right, my friends. So once again, thanks so much for joining us today. And hopefully we'll see you next time for another intrepid adventure. Bye.